Hello, my babes. I hope ni right, ni bright, ni the way. I hope that you are staying safe and that you are staying healthy and where you can, that you're staying home. And if you can't and you need to be out and about, that you're continuing to, you know, practice the basics of wearing a mask, social distancing, um, sanitizing, washing your hands, all those things. Whatever it takes to to keep yourself healthy and to get us through this pandemic, right? I hope that you are right and bright. And depending on what time of the day you're watching this, it could be Ndima Chelo, Ndima Siaru, or Ndima Dekwa Nabuti. So pick one. <laughs> Welcome to episode two. I want to say Twitter. Uh, like wild dream days <laughs> round 20 oh i digress welcome to episode two of the heart to heart uh with myself Ulisa Ravele. before i tell you more about it i just want to say thank you so so much thank you to everybody that has taken the time to watch episode one with lira um to share your thoughts and your comments about how much you loved it the conversation and that um yeah, you said you did, it wasn't perfect, but we didn't see anything wrong with that. All of that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I really, really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Nodi Um, Episode two. This is what was actually meant to be episode one. It was meant to be the pilot of what was then in 2016 going to be called Conversations with Ulisa Ravele. You'll hear, I think when I'm welcoming the guest, I even say welcome to conversation. That's why. Um, and it looks different in terms of like, you'll see it's got a voiceover piece. It's got pictures as well, because again, it was the pilot, right? Uh, so that's the difference between the, the first episode and this one. And about the guest, sure. The guest for this one is Bob Mabena. And the reason it was such a sure moment for me is because the day before I was um, going to shoot in 2016 I didn't have a fourth guest I don't remember if someone cancelled or what happened but either way there was no guest and it was really a big bummer for me because I was like ah I spent all this money and I want to get as much out of it as possible right so I was talking to the man in my life at the time and he was like no man what about Bob and I was like yeah I mean I'd love to but I don't know him like that you know anyway long story short I get Bob McBenner's number give him a call. I don't know if I called his office or whatnot. Either way, Bob McBenner agrees the day before to come for this interview the next day. And it just blew my mind because I was like, the Bob McBenner is like making time for me and last minute on top of that. So I was very, very grateful. And it was such an insightful conversation. It was so beautiful. Um, and from then you know we we kind of like have a really good relationship that's formed from then and i call him uncle bob he calls me pumpkin patch because yeah inside jokes and you know freckles and speckles or sing a little song anyway <laughs> i hope that you sit back and you enjoy this heart to heart with my uncle <laughs> bob my bella Bob Homoto Mabena was born in Attridgeville, west of Pretoria in 1969. An inductee in the MTN Radio Awards Hall of Fame, his career began in 1989 when he joined Radio Bob in the then Republic of Maputatswana. Fast forward 27 years and the likes of Metro FM, 947 and Kai FM can proudly count Bob Mabena as one of their own. His passion for radio continued off the air as he moved into management at various radio stations, first as a programs manager, then station manager, and later as an executive and then director. No stranger to controversy, especially when it comes to his love life, Bob Mabena has risen above time and time again and counts his illustrious career and his children as his biggest achievements. Husband, father, businessman, and living legend, this is a conversation with Bob Mabena. I, my 
Martha say Uncle Bob? How, how, how does it work? I would Uncle Bob. Bob is fine. I would okay, Bob. I would Bob. Ma- you know. No, it's Malume makes you sound like, you know, or oh, oh, push up on my 60s. <laughs> so I think I would Bob will work out. That Welcome work. to that Conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful dress. Thank you. Hey, I want to push up flyness, you know. You are in the Hall of Fame in the Radio Awards. You're an inductee. And just, I would also have a tragedy. Yeah. When you were growing up in Atridgeville, was there ever a thinking of, there's got to be more, man? Because it's a film. No. Um, I had a very protected uh, childhood. Mm. I, I, I was one of those kids who always had the pump, asthma pump, as an extension of my head. And I was born with chronic asthma. So I couldn't play in the streets because of the dust would clog wow. me up. I couldn't play <laughs> just outside in the grass because there was an allergy there as well. So I was just one of those kids who was thrown books. Any book, I was just, if I wasn't reading, my mother would smack me. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of upbringing. So it was a very narrow upbringing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, the whole neighborhood, even now as we speak, there are people who ask me, oh, you know, <laughs> like we never, we don't remember one seeing man, one guy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, when you brought narrowly like that, it, the world is, is what it is. It's, it's right here. It's only, you know, during high school that, Oh, there's girls. <laughs> <laughs> there's a life I didn't know about. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Did your eyes pop out at that time when, when you realized, hurry, there's another life out there? Yeah, I mean, you know, even at primary, I went to the same schools my two brothers went mm-hmm. to. So I was always under their shadow. All the way up to secondary school, you know, where it was always, you must be in the top five because your brother Vic was always number one and he was, mm. you know. So there was that whole thing where people were focusing on how is he going to do. It's only when I got to high school that, you know, I became into my own, discovered my own personality, things I liked, things I didn't like. I was a pretty generic kid. Your parents divorced when, just, just after you were born? Just now, before I was born. Just before? Yep. Okay. Yep. Did, did that destabilize you in any way or was there a sense of closeness that still remained and normalcy in your life? Between me and my dad. Between you and your dad and the relationship that your mom and dad had with you? With my dad it was like nothing. That's it? I don't actually remember being with him before we reconnected at all. There may have been moments, you know. Mm. But I think I had such, a, such an uneventful childhood that I don't have any serious memories of, of him and my mom. All I know is that 10 years later, up until she died, she, mm. she was still with him on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> a greater love I haven't seen. Now, growing up, there are so many internal conflicts that many of us experience. I think all of us, actually, whether it's self-belief or self-acceptance. What did you struggle the most with uh, as a child, besides being an introvert, you know? Um, that was the big thing, hey? Mm. Uh, but also that, that whole thing of, of everybody or most people around me talking about their dads and their mums, you know, because my mom passed away when I was 11 years old. Mm. So that, that for me was, was, was a struggle because it, I was the last born for her, you know, so I spent a little bit more time with her. Mm. Um, and, and also, you know, the, the trauma of, you know, with, with us black people, we, we adopt, yes. you know, uh, unconventionally. So I was moved a little bit too much, you know, so that, that displaced me a little bit. And uh, you tend to create your own world as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's another big thing that I, that I, I used to imagine my dad walking in and coming to get me. You know, uh, I used to imagine my mother coming back and saying, no, 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 I had just gone to Zambia or something. Yeah. I've come back, you know. I, I struggled with that for a while. And, uh, you know, my grandmother was my biggest life coach. Mm. You know, she, she got me out of it. I was about to ask, how do you process those feelings being so young? Because I think one thing that most black people struggle with is the turning to either psychologists or professional help in order to get through an ordeal such as grieving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I understand your grandmother being there for you and coaching you through it, but physically, if somebody is sitting at home and practically, how am I getting through this? I've lost my parent and I'm just like, there's no way out. I, I don't want any more. It's lonely mm. uh, because Back then, it, it, it's changing now because uh, a lot of black people are in touch with the emotions and all. Back then, it was a thing when I to see, Ish. you know, and, 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 and nobody really looked at your suffering, you know, that they took care of the older ones who they believed 
understood. So it, it was a very lonely world, you know. Uh, but, but I believe only now, when you're older, you're wiser, you know, you got the benefit of the rearview mirror. Yeah. Only now I believe, you know, that, that, that it, it, all in God's hands, you know, seriously, because you never get a challenge that God doesn't give you the tools to, to go through it. My grandmother, books and television and radio helped me. You were surrounded. You know? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I learned how to fashion the way I speak by, by watching a lot of TV, listening mm. to uh, music radio 702 at the time. So the loneliness crept in now and then. But for the longest time, I had books everywhere. I had radio, I had TV. So I created my own world. I was like, okay, fine, you know, everybody's ignoring me. I'm here and I'm dealing with myself. I didn't even know I was doing it. It's only now on reflection that I was like, you know what? That was actually a nice defense mechanism. You say that you were destined to be in the world of music. I mean, between your dad who was a trumpeter, your mom who was into vocal jazz, your brothers who introduced you from everything between rock and reggae, yep. and the uncles who loved jazz and <laughs> introduced you to it, it was just music all over. Wall to wall. You joined Radio Bob in 1989. I mean, I must say your, your radio career spans just about my entire lifetime. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, you say it's one of the best days of your life. Please relive the very first day that you were on radio. Oh man, it, you know, it, it was, it began like a dream, you know, where you, you promise people certain things, you know, and I, I told my grandmother, this, this is what's going to happen, mm -hmm. you know with no guarantee whatsoever. I just really knew it inside. And when that day came, it was one of those unbelievable days where I was, I knew this was gonna happen, but maybe two years later, because of, you know, I was turned down so many times, mm. but I was, you know, willing to be patient enough to get there. And the studio is, is like, you're running, you're flying a Boeing 747, you know, you've got all the, set of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got all these buttons that are glowing and everything. You are 19 years old, starry-eyed, you're in a foreign country. <laughs> and, and it's all like this really wonderful environment. And then you start thinking, I'm gonna turn on that mic. And for the first time, more than 10 people are gonna be listening to me and only me. Oh. So I better have my act together, but you don't concentrate too much on it. You're like, what? I'm gonna have fun because even if I do it for just one day and I get fired, at least I would have done it. It's a dream I've lived it. And, and, and you know, my, 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 my ex-wife then, who was a colleague, mm. held my hand from beginning to end. She, she really supported me on the day. And you know, I had people, at some stage you feel like a, a, a dissected frog in a lab because I had people at the door, program manager was not so sure, like we've <laughs> never put anyone on air without real hard training, training without the graveyard shift. So everybody, you know, was, 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 was tense mm. and, and, and they couldn't be further from the studio. And how I managed, you know, this so I really believe in God's grace. How I actually did all that with people actually watching me and knowing the pressure and being able to just close it all off yeah. and fly. It, only by God's grace, you know. That is why for, for me that day was so special in that I actually did it. You know, there was no stumbling. There was no, the only mistake I made was to not flip over the ad schedule mm. and play the ads, you know. But I didn't play the ads, so I played three more songs and people enjoyed it. That's why that day for me was so special in that I enjoyed every bit of it. From Bob to Metro FM to High Felt, well, 947 now these yep. days. <laughs> and now on to Kaya. What would you say the lessons are that you take off the air? Lessons off air, you know, is <laughs> funny enough. I, I learned how to endear myself to people who don't like me. Mm. Let me explain that. When I left Metro, I, I had done it all on, on, on black radio, so to speak. You know, so there was a... There was a certain level of boredom, and, and I, I easily get bored. <laughs> Noli enough. It's horrible Actually, thing. Actually, Noli enough. Horrible, <laughs> horrible, horrible thing about me. I get bored very quickly, and, very, and when I get bored, I get restless, I get depressed, and, and you know, I, I always need to be moving. And when Stan Kez met me at reception, like, dude, you know, when can he join us? I was like, how about now? And then I went upstairs, I resigned, 
and then I Bye, joined. Felicia. Thanks. You know? It's been great. <laughs> so there was, at that time, Prime Media had just acquired um, uh, Highfield, which was Weffield Stereo. Mm. And they were changing it. I mean, I, mean I, I, I believe that Prime Media, when it comes to change, Prime Media can foresee it and get it done. Yeah. You know, and when they got high felt, they didn't waste any time. They were like, okay, fine. A black presenter, black presenter, black presenter. The music is rock and roll and a bit of R&B, a bit of reggae. So for the normal listener, it was like, these black people mm. are coming to change our thing here, you know? And, and, and it, wasn't very, it wasn't very comfortable. Mm. Um, but I learned a way to endear myself. There was this white woman who just every time, man, Every time Tony Braxton or Bob Marley played, she would call and she would call me the K word and all that. You know, I had two choices. One, I had to be the victim, or I had to find a way. To, I love a challenge. I had to find a way to flip her, you know. And I thought to myself, people have a common denominator as challenges as people normally, as human beings, the human race. And smoking is one of them, mm -hmm. you know. So I went on air. I was like, I was guessing that she was a smoker. A horrible gamble, but it paid out. I was talking about how I was struggling with smoking. All of a sudden, she forgot about the K-word. She forgot about this thing. She was like, brand. my goodness, me too, you know? And, and, and in my lectures, when I lecture about radio, I always say to, to, to uh, would-be presenters that sometimes, not all the time and not overtly, you've got to wear your heart on your sleeve a bit. Let people understand that you're not this machine that's coming out of a speaker. Because once you do that, there will be listeners who will identify with you. Mm. And that makes you human. And it was a beautiful challenge and I embraced it and, and off we went. We became very good friends on, on air, you know, so that, that, was, that settled me. 26, 27 years in the game, a lot of people would have bowed out by now. The passion would be out. Why are you still on air? In, in, a, in a very crass way, I always say radio is like a venereal disease that doesn't go away. It's like that luggage that doesn't leave you. It's a virus. Once you get a bite of it, or once it gets a bite of you, it, it, it never leaves you. I mean, I went into management. Uh, I also took a sabbatical for about a year and a half off radio completely. Mm -hmm. I was working on uh, establishing my own company. And man, it was, it was like, come back, you know? And then I started back with a show on the weekend and then on to, uh, I'll never And have. now the rest is history. <laughs> We're here today. I read an interview where it said that Mabena is, let me quote it, you know, because I don't want to be unquote off guard. Is <laughs> <laughs> not impressed but what, but what he calls pretty faces with an audience coming into the radio. That back in the day, it was really about going through rigorous training and it was really about the voice and the talent more than who you are and the numbers that you can pull. Yeah. Do you still stand by this statement? No, I, I think two things happened there. Um, it wasn't even what the interview was about. Mm. Um, and, and then my words were twisted to be talking about Bonan, which, okay. which I thought was salacious, you know. Um, but no, um, I don't, not anymore. Uh, simply because, you know, the world has changed. Mm. And, and I'm one of those people who for a long time you had to drag me kicking and screaming for, for, for how radio was changing. I was too old school with radio. You know, until, you know, a few years ago, a few months ago, where I looked at it and I thought, hold on just a second. I wasn't talking about Bonang, but let's look at Bonang herself. What's mm. happened? Numbers went up. Uh, television took her on as well, which means that there is some kind of value that she brings to this medium. Yeah. And then I looked at it and I thought, okay, fine. What has happened to media in general? There was television and radio, end of story, newspapers and magazines. But television and radio mainly, lived on their own, like two silos. Mm. And then when came our era with Melanie, television and radio merged. Yeah. Now you have Instagram and Twitter. And look at how many followers Bonang has on Twitter. Look at how many she has on Instagram as well. That all translate in this force, this juggernaut that actually helps radio. Yeah. Why? Because originally radio has always been that threatened medium. But what, what radio has morphed into is a sponge where every little media that is born, radio absorbs it. Takes it in. And, and uses it, you yeah. know. So it was a paradox for me to have had those ideas. Mm. Now, I, now I see it more wild, widely now. And I think, as a matter of fact, whoever thought about the strategy of having more now, we had 
no experience whatsoever in radio and still doesn't really sound great on radio but look at the numbers does it matter whether she has the call letters or does all the basics of radio no she's got the listeners in there and the advertisers she's making money and that's the that's bottom really line what you want yeah so it's yeah. literally bottom line now these Absolutely. days hi guess is i want to pambili we'll see if things will change one day <laughs> You've often referred to your career as one that has been filled with ups and downs, yeah. flat lines, tears, mm. you know. Um, after losing your mom at the age of 11, how would you say, you know, I know we touched on her passing earlier, but how would you say that affected the trajectory of your life and how you perceived life after that? Sped it up. I had to do some quick growing up. Uh, and, you know, I was saying to my wife the other day, you know, that <sighs> mixed feelings. Because I know that had my mother been alive, I'd be an academic. Mm. There's no, there's, this nonsense here, DJ. <laughs> Radio it, man. It was not going to happen, mm. you know. And I was thinking, bittersweet, because she's God. And then I came to the summation that, you know, to God, we're just souls. One is not more important than the other. Mm. For this soul to progress, I'm going to remove this soul. You know, I don't think God thinks, it's a miracle old lady, I can't, you know, if that soul will move, that soul will flourish, you know. So that how, that's how in the end I was able to live with, because I suffered for a very long time, well into my 30s, for, mm. for, for, from the loss of my mom. They say nothing can prepare you for loss, and after the loss of your mom, obviously not one after the other, but then it's the loss of your older brother, Jeffrey. How does one carry on after suffering so much loss, especially because yeah. it's just the two of you? I don't know. You know, there, there, there is really no formula. I, th I think it, 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 it also has to do with your proximity to God and his proximity to you as well, mm -hmm. you know, because God sometimes just lets things happen. You know, uh, think of uh, Job, you know, yeah. the story of Job, you know. So it, 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 it's, I mean, Jeff died in October of 1980. And then my mother died in December of 1980. So it was like skip a month mm. and you lose another family member. Well, you know what? Two jabs of an injection is better on the same day than one on Monday. <laughs> and then one and a few days later. To put it simplistically, yeah. you know. But grief is not something that you get over very quickly. You get angry. You get angry at God. You get angry at everyone. You know, I, I remember being angry at, at, at a friend in high school who had no idea what was happening in my life and made fun of me, you know. And I was like, how could he? I, I wanted to rip his head off, you know. So there's anger, there's, there's remorse, there's, there's just, you know, mixed feelings until, you know, it kicks in that this person is actually not coming back. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to. So, you know, the move from one relative to another as well didn't help. But in the end, when I went to live with my grandmother, it kind of, she represented my mother, she was funny as hell, <laughs> she was hard as well, and you know, everybody else. You know when you, when you start to realize you're the favorite? <laughs> you know, you kind of floss it. You, you were know? that guy. I, was, I, was, I, was, I became that guy, you know, because the, the last conversation they had was, I think my mother could see her demise coming. I was like, take care of this one. Yeah. You know, he's fragile and all that, you know, so my grandmother made it you know, her duty to bring me even closer and to have more conversations. I mean, the first conversation about sex I had with my grandmother, I wanted to dig a hole and then... <laughs> it was, yeah, it was one of those, hey? <laughs> now, you've been through it all uh, from the tabloids, from baby mama drama to love triangles to yeah. your divorce being laid out in, in the papers. But there came a time in your life where you just didn't decide to tap out because I feel like someone would tap out. They'd be like, wait a second, get up, get right, get right, get grandy. It's okay, we don't yeah. need to do this mm. anymore. <laughs> Why love again? Because, it, again, quite biblical. We are made in God's image, we are made by God. What is God? God is love. love. So we can't help but, but love. It, it, it's in us. There is no other, you know, we, we, we begin with love and end with love. Congratulations on giving marriage a second chance and you. marrying your longtime love, Eucharist. Yeah. There's a post that I saw on Twitter that you recently posted, and yo, smell Tile, wait till yo, I was throwing circles on the floor. It was a picture of her, and you said, and then she happened to me. My goodness, showers of love. Yeah. She happened to me. 
She Talk did. to me about that. She did. Um, I was um, estranged from, from the mother of my, my last child, Komoto. And uh, it was one of those, I was about to tap out, actually. I was thinking, you know, this, this is not working. I should really fully, yeah, that's the idea. Get into work, you know, bury myself in work. And then, and I was going, it was really quite, it was really quite okay. I was staying in a hotel and, uh, you know, I, I, I called you, Kirsten. I was like, you know, because we worked in the same office and I was like, okay, I need company. Can you find me someone that I can, you know, because I think you have cool friends. You know? <laughs> You're not cool, but I think you have cool hook friends. Hook me up, hook you know? a brother hook up. Hook a brother up, you know. <laughs> and she goes, I'll hook you up, I'll hook you up. And then we started talking about radio, which was one of the assets that the company has because I worked for a holding company. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and she was like, you know what, why don't actually you mentor me on, on this radio thing? And then all of a sudden we realized that actually we have a connection, you know. So there was not that whole thing of Homoshela and whatever. She happened to me, you know, it's amazing when, 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 when you see someone every day, you talk to them at a certain level, and all of a sudden you start seeing them differently. It, it, it's, it's, it's a, a crazy, moment. Yeah, it, it just happens just like that. You know, I was like, hold on just a second. Actually, this is her right here, you know. She happened to me and, and, and my goodness, thank God she did. Mm. A career that spans almost three decades now, a family and just joy. What would you say your proudest achievement has been in life? My kids. Um, they're so different one from the other. Um, you know, I have a kid who wrote a book and published from a Blackberry phone. Rene Lue. Rene Lue. <laughs> uh, he's, he's quirky. He's not your normal kid. I mean, mm. he, will, he has a really weird sense of humor. We all know him like that. <laughs> and the fact that I can get with them together, you know, Clementine, who's your, she's pretty much like my mom, you know, um, popular girl, just <laughs> really out for, you want a good time? Uh, Miss Clementine is guaranteed to, to, to give you a good time. Gamu, who's your accountant, you know, numbers and then proper and things have to be in a certain order and mm -hmm. strict and, and, and he budgets for everyone, you know. Um, Sihle, who's my prayer warrior, you know, mm. you want a prayer? That's where you go, you know, she will cover you and she will bless you and, she, and she's just too wholesome, you know. Adimakato, mm. uh, who's my Kim Kardashian? You know, she just loves to look good and, and do all sorts of things and, and she's just too prissy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Komoto, who's just crazy, she's four years old and she's, she's crazy and loving and gives the best hugs in the world. And you know, I got one coming now, it's a boy mm -hmm. and, and we call him Elihu. Uh, so I think that name and it also means I am, mm -hmm. God is, you know. So it's a whole, like I've got like this zoo, my it kids, works. you know. It, it works by, by God's grace. So my biggest achievement is really my kids and, 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 and second to that will be, you know, my career in that I've dipped in and, in and out so many times and, and, and I don't need any more proof mm -hmm. that I was supposed to do this. This is what I was born for, radio, you know. It's, it's, it's held me up, it's given me a voice, it's given me a face, it's given me fame and fortune, mm -hmm. it's given me sadness, all the elements that life is about. All in this one it. thing. Yeah. Define happiness. Happiness is love. There's no two ways about it. And it goes the other way around as well. Love is happiness, happiness is love. Have you found purpose in life? A long time ago. To love and honor God and then everything else comes after that. All the success, the money, the fame. After you've done your duty from your creator, then boom, that's, that's success. What will Bob Mabena be remembered for? Being a great father. Um, I will never win Father of the Year award because I'm human, I'm fallible. I will make mistakes and I know the mistakes I've made so far and I will make more as a, as a father. But at least I want to be remembered for being one who died trying and trying hard. Mm. Mr Mabena, father, visionary, <laughs> leader, teacher, Legend, thank you so much for your time and Pleasure. all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you for Ah. <laughs>